<laughs> this episode of the Off-Road Podcast is sponsored by Warren Medical Gear Outfitters and Colby Valve. Off-Road Podcast, episode 372, how to choose your off-road kit. Tonight, Aaron tests his generator by plugging in a fork. Jeremy can't wheel his Jeep, and Ben gets more stuff. Welcome to the Off-Road Podcast, the podcast about everything off-road. We cover the news, review products, and interview people in the off-road industry. Your hosts tonight are Aaron, Jeremy, and my name is Ben. And yes, and do, indeed, we do like corn, especially Aaron. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense if, unless you were there before the show. Oh, it's or, popular enough. I think enough people know that it's all about. Yeah, hopefully people know the corn song. I didn't. And if, and if you don't, after the show is over, go to YouTube and type in corn song. Don't do corn, C-O-R-N, corn. No, it's, it's corn, K-O-R-N. No, the weekend review is brought to you by medical gear outfitters what are you waiting for are you waiting to have a casualty on the trail check out medicalgearoutfitters.com to get straightened out medical gear outfitters has everything you need whether you're going out for the day or traveling on a year-long expedition head over there to get off-road specific kits that meet all of your needs and while you're there make sure you use off-road podcast for 10 percent off so Guess what? I need my first aid kit again today. <laughs> what did you do? Oh, it wasn't for me, actually. So the kids were playing with uh, some of their neighbor friends, and there was a head-on collision. So I ran out, and I was like, okay, let, let's see what we can do here. And uh, we just had a skinned knee, and uh, he needed an ice pack. So fortunately, I have a box full of those disposable ice packs. Oh, nice. Because I keep... I keep one or two in my first aid kit, depending upon the kit I have, um, because of the incident where my son got a black eye playing soccer. So I just started keeping, I bought a box of them. It was cheaper that way. Cause it yeah. was like, at the time, I think it was like 13 bucks for a big box of them versus paying like a dollar for one. And there's like 20 something in that box. So they're handy. Yeah. Used it today, yep. Tim. That is the uh, Tim. That's the wrong corn song. So try again. Well, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad you didn't need the uh, first aid kit. Well, I've, uh, I've been injury free, knocking on some wood. Yeah. Um. Because yeah, I I I, I got stuff to do. I uh, a, a first aid kit wouldn't have helped me today, but I, um, well, I guess it could have. Um, I tripped going down some attic stairs at a job site and um, I had my arms up in the attic still. And so I caught myself, but it pulled something in my shoulder. So a little Ooh. sore there. Ice pack. Um, I, I guess I could have iced it. Um, I did take some ibuprofen. So I guess I could have used a first aid kit, ice pack and ibuprofen. So yeah, Eric wants to know how long those ice packs uh, last. Um, like five, 10 minutes. Oh, they're just, that's all. Okay. Yeah, they're just the little ones. They're like, like that big. Gotcha. They have bigger ones that you can get, um, but it's just the little one. Uh, it's the bottom. Kids on. don't know. Yeah. Honestly, it's five minutes is all a kid needs, anyways. Exactly. And I mean, yeah. I've used them, and you can get them to last longer. Like if you've got it wrapped with a towel, that's going to help insulate it and kind of keep that cold in there. Oh, also, how long do they store? I don't know. I've had my I've had that box for three years and they still work. I imagine they'd at least last five years. It's like the chemicals inside a little bubbly pack and you pop it and then it mixes and makes it cold. Yeah. I'm sure they have an expiration date that isn't really an expiration date on them. Yeah. Well, Ben. Have you done anything else besides uh, using your first aid kit this week? Um. Well, I'm in the process of a couple things. So I mentioned uh, siding on my house. Um, that's actually the materials are getting dropped off this week, and it's gonna get start getting sited uh, this Wednesday or Thursday. I think he said. Um, it, as soon as the uh, um, as soon as they finish 
getting all taken care of, and then we lost Jeremy. Um, so that got rid of one project, and it was a whole lot cheaper than I was expecting. So my shop fund is a little better, well packed. Um, That's good. Uh, and I'm going to go check out this place that builds like um, they're not pull barns. Um, because I think this route might be a little cheaper and still get me what I want. It's like the metal, um, they do, what are they called? Uh, carports, like the metal ones, but they also do garages. And then I will uh, build my garage and have a studio in it. Yeah, so it's like um, halfway between a carport and a pole barn is how I would explain it. It's like a, a, a U-Haul storage unit. Yeah is almost what it's like 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 that's the quality of it i would say with the roll-up doors and all that so i'm gonna have to do some insulation um i imagine I'll, I'll probably have to build four walls to insulate it i'm not sure how well those walls will insulate the metal walls i'll find out as i go um well i i'm still researching it figuring out if that's the route i'm gonna go um because I'm going to try and speed up the process and like do some of the permitting myself to make things move faster. Cause I know if you have other people doing the permitting for you, it'll move a little slower. So, hmm. well, their website said you had to do all the permitting anyway. So, Oh, so there's a dip, the, the place in um, Sumner that I was telling you about that we were looking okay. at, they actually do the permitting and they actually help with the con or they don't, I don't know if they do the permitting. They help with the permitting, but the yeah. uh, they do concrete too. Hmm. So, are they called garages, etc.? No, it's um, um, it's uh, what's it called? Uh, sheds for less or something like that. Okay. Go in the house. Sorry, I have a visitor. Um, and then the other thing is, is so I talked to you about this. Uh, no one else is. Um, this is my grandpa's Jeep truck. It was last registered in 1995. That was the last time it drove. Um, the rear diff started going out and it got parked because grandpa was going to fix it later. And we all know how that goes. Well, I, it was offered to me because my dad's moving. And at first I was like, uh, I, no, I thought about it. Aaron and I talked to it and it was like, mm, no, probably shouldn't do it. Then I heard a story and it made me change my mind. Even <laughs> made my wife change her mind. She actually got behind it. Wow. So this Jeep was also before it was my grandpa's was my great grandpa's. And they drove down to Chile and back with it. I mean, Chili's like the rest, the restaurant. No, Chile, like the country, South America. Oh, okay. So, so I mean, if you want an overland vehicle, that's the OG overlander right there. Apparently, that would be OG overlanding for sure. So, uh, this is the truck I grew up going fishing in, and all that. So, um, I talked to my wife, and I, she was like, eh. and then I was on the phone with my dad. And she's like, she looked over at me and she's like, you know what? If you really do want it, yep, you just got to get rid of your dad's Jeep that's in the yard. And the only reason it's still in the yard is because I haven't fixed it yet. So I'm going to fix it. And grandpa's Jeep's getting fixed. I've got cool. permission. So it's coming home. Um, you, you get what I mean now after having that conversation? Yep. It's it's like okay, there's there's enough sentimental value to yeah. say, you know what? Yep, it needs to come home. Because right. I was kind of like, I don't know if I want to fix stuff or not. So, so yeah, um, so garage is on the way, and Jeep trucks um, got to be picked up by the end of the month. I haven't brought it home yet, and so I've got to get that handled. But I've also got well, the call. Don't you have AAA be like, hey, I ran out of gas oh, again. My goodness that would be hilarious um i wonder if i could get rick's triple a <laughs> <laughs> no you know Eric, eric's commenting here drive it to chile if i get it fixed and that would be epic and so i don't know um for now i'm calling it project grandpa truck 
I don't know if I'll lift it or do anything crazy to it. Um, I think I'm going to go as far as stripping it down all the way because looking at it, <laughs> it looks like it needs to be stripped down all the way. I would just pressure wash it and run the patina for a while. Oh, well, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking like checking out the frame. I've got, Oh, a, okay. Drop okay. Gas tank. Me um, mechanical wise. Mechanically. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm going to clean up the interior. Um, cause that's a little rough right there. Yeah. Like 30 years rough of, so yeah, but I mean, it's so cool. And that, 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 camper i sat in the back of that so many times like every weekend over the course of um between the ages of three and seven so i think seven i don't know when how old was i in 95 yeah that would have been about seven or eight so so yeah project grandpa truck we'll see where it goes Kevin says at least yarn in the Midwest it'd be only rust. And Eric says the wire harness has six wires total, so that is easy to upgrade. Oh yeah. I, I there's <laughs> so many things I can fix with that. Jeremy totally yeah. this whole thing, so he doesn't know what's going on. I, I don't. Word to the wise, don't apparently don't upgrade your internet right before the show starts because then they switch off your internet in order to upgrade you. <laughs> oh, that, that's why you just went dark. Yes. <laughs> I was like, well, Jeremy had an emergency. He's got to go. All of a sudden it was like, oh, and I can't see anybody. Oh, great. What happened? I just figured Jeremy went to Chili's also. I didn't hear the joke about Chili's, so I'll have to catch it up. You'll, have to, you'll yeah. have to listen to it now. Listen to it to catch back up. Yep. So, yep, that's Project Grandpa Truck and... uh We'll see how long that takes. Probably forever, because I've got a million projects, and I added one more. Because why not? And how? So you're already filling up the garage again, eh? Yeah, but look he's still at, he's filling up he's filling up the new garage that he doesn't have built yet. Yeah, it's it's but a have that built. Well, so um, just real quickly for you, um, that's my great grandpa's truck, and he drove it down to Chile. And that was enough to get my wife convinced to let me bring it home. Not Chile, the restaurant. Yeah. South America. <laughs> Chile. Chile. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, that, that'll that be that. Um, I'll probably have a lot more to talk about it once it comes home. But I've got to get that figured out. And I'm in the middle of having to do a bunch of stuff to the house real quick before the sighting guy comes. Because they're dropping off the sighting tomorrow. And I have to have, it's coming a lot quicker than I thought it was. So it is what it is. What about you, Aaron? Well, uh, I got the roof finished on my shop this past weekend. Um, I needed to put the gable trim on so that I could put the, uh, the peak metal on. So I got that done. Uh, oh yeah, I got pictures. So you can see I got the, the ridge cap and the gable trim is on. So, and you can see in the background, uh, it's a little hazy. Yes. Um, we had a red flag event here, um, in the Pacific Northwest, not just my area, but the whole Pacific Northwest. I shouldn't say the whole, the whole West coast is probably better. And because of that PGE, which is our, uh, electricity provider said, uh, we're going to be shutting your power off on Friday and it'll come back on when it comes back on ouch um yeah no anything no update was it, no nothing did they say like it, because of wind or just because it was red flag so with the red flag event you've got wind hot temperatures and dry ground and you can see our field in the background in this picture it's it's mostly mostly brown so oh yeah definitely um so yeah it's uh it's definitely dry out there. So what happens is the wind blows, it knocks trees down, trees hit power lines, power lines spark, arc, and start fires. And that's actually the fire. That's how that fire started two years ago near my house, um, just north of my house. So, um, yeah, so they cut the power so that if trees do fall and knock power lines down, they won't start things on fire. And 
thankfully there were no fires because of that. There were still some other fires. And I would say that because people were without power and they didn't have to fight all these other fires, they were able to get these, they weren't had, they didn't have to fight the electrical fires. They were able to put the regular fires out. So Tim wants to know if I won the red flag event. I would say that I won um, because I grew in my preparedness levels. So, um, or he says, or is that just the events you put on? Yeah, <laughs> no, I didn't put this event on, but I learned, um, we had to run generators to keep our refrigerators and our deep freezes going. And we, we also have a brand new crop of, um, meat chickens out in the barn and they're only like a week old. And so at nighttime, even though it's super hot during the day at nighttime, they need heat lamps. So we had to run a generator at night to keep them warm to keep the heat lamps going there commented about um uh, in oklahoma they would uh have the red flag event since may if that was the criteria and they don't have that but uh we have a bit more trees up here <laughs> that's true yeah i don't think there is there trees in oklahoma there's i some. think they just i think they just grow wheat maybe they have tall wheat i don't know but so, um We've been and they only they only did shut they only did shut the power off to rural areas because that's um where there's more trees they didn't shut the power off to cities and things like that so there's some conspiracy theories out there that people are like oh um there it's PGEs trying to come down on the conservatives out in the country and it's like oh my goodness <laughs> yeah we um we've been pretty fortunate overall so far up here with the fires i mean we've got what two three active fires right now big fires in our state but i mean they really didn't start until late august i mean the years before we were having fire in june july what hmm. did we lose ben this no time? can you hear me yeah yeah um, i don't know I'm not sure why our videos keep rotating every time we click on a comment to pop a comment up. So Eric says uh, that they've got the whole Southeast of Oklahoma is a forest. So we're just kidding about those middle States. So, um, and no, Eric, I have legitimate chickens, not some other crop growing with heat lamps. And Tim, like I said, there's 50 of them. It's hard to sit on 50 chickens to keep them warm. So I've I, got a your mom joke, but I can't think of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like Jeremy just froze. Right, yeah. Something. It's that new internet he's got. I I I don't know. <laughs> you were frozen, but at least you had a smile on while you're frozen. Well, Jeremy, why don't you tell us? Yeah, nice try. Why don't you tell us uh, what you've been up to um before you freeze and we lose you again? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe every time I talk, I'll freeze now. Um, so the, my wife's car is in the shop getting transmission work done. So I had the issue what? over the weekend. <sighs> I was, thought it was probably a bad idea in case I broke the Jeep somehow. And then we were down to no cars. No cars in a yep. motorcycle? Figured my wife wouldn't like that very much. So I probably not to go, go uh, wheeling and just so so you, you don't have a sidecar for your dual sport so that you can fit the whole thing <laughs> I, my dual sport isn't working remember oh no i didn't i don't i didn't remember that no i didn't remember that at all it's a while ago i mean that was like back in february so i would have assumed it would have been fixed night by now no, it takes so you still have that sh that sheared off crankshaft something or another yeah, uh, not sector mm. shaft. I always want to call it a sector shaft. It's a. No. Uh, I can't remember. So right now you're driving your Jeep to work. No, I bought a new bike, but not oh. a. Oh. Oh okay. You've got a sport bike now. Uh, it's a cruiser, not a sport bike. Oh, he he's he's in a biker gang. That's why he was missing. He is, yeah. That makes sense. Yep, he makes sense. Over there. I was, he's been. Uh... <laughs> yes, Tim. 
I have no no other time to fix vehicles because I own a Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Jeremy's got the prost prospect patch on his back now because he's got a cruiser. Yeah, yeah you know it. Sons of he's not a full fledged not a full fledged member yet. No. Nope. I, I gotta murder somebody first. So man, if if I knew that that's what you're supposed to do when something breaks, you just buy a new something and just park it. I could have been ahead a long time ago. <laughs> how, how many of the uh, how many Toyotas would I own by now? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, broke it. Time for a new one. Yep. Oh, I mean, it was mainly because the the price to have it fixed way out way exceeded the price of the bike. And, yeah. And oh, that makes I more sense. I've done it myself, but it's like a pretty extensive rebuild. And I just haven't had the time to go and do it. So, so you wonder in the winter rebuilding it. Well, like, like you did your Jeep. Well, the other problem with it is it's really hard to find the right part because the bike's too old. Mm. Counter shaft. That's what it's called. Counter shaft. Okay. Um, and so you can really only find them like used. And I don't want to buy a used one and spend all that time rebuilding the engine. What if you bought an entire used engine? Uh, I don't know. Tim Tim says, Ben, comma, Toyotas don't break. Uh, you, your sentence structure is really wrong there, Tim. It should say, Ben's Toyotas break. Yes. Yeah. See, I'm the guy that takes that whole Toyota reliability thing, and I'd be like, mm, have you met Ben? That's all you have to say in the conversation. Have you met Ben? You have should you meet Ben. ben drive? Huh? Have you seen Ben drive? Yeah. It's there, there's this whole conversation you could have with a person be like, have you met meet yeah. my friend Ben? He he'll he'll show you Toyota reliability. So well, I'm I'm no better. I the last time I took my niece on, on a trip was our snow camping trip. So I'm just as bad. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm not much better. So it'll be now that the roof is on the shop, it'll get tucked in the shop soon and I'll start tearing it apart. So yeah, I've got I've got a bundle of things I'm gonna have to do and I think I may have to do my uh um steering rack, my rack. So I'm not looking forward to that. Yeah. And you're right, Tim. Toy Ben's Toyota did have nine hundred thousand miles on it when he bought it, so I mean that's it's ro cool. I mean, it's it rolled over to two hundred and something now. So it went all the way past one million or one hundred. Yeah. 000. No, not one hundred thousand. No, one million. Yeah. Yeah. I was right. The Actually, I was uh, doing some math. I've almost put a uh, hundred thousand on the Forerunner. I'll probably do it next year. In one year. Uh, I'll I'll hit. I'll hit the hundred thousand that I've bought it since I bought it. Yeah. So, that'll be, I don't know if that'll be exciting or. I don't think that's exciting. You don't think it's exciting that I owned a vehicle and put that many miles on it in five years. No, no, it needs more that's miles. A lot of miles. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of miles in five years. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's going to Montana multiple times south dakota twice i don't think i've i think i've put 120,000 miles on my frontier 120 no i don't think i've put 120 on it and i've had it for 14 years tim 14, says he's no, had his jeep for 12 years and put 12 years on it it's because it's been well broken. it's because it's been broken yep no, I, I, if I wouldn't have lost, uh, had the head gasket because that what is that for like six months with a blown head gasket, mm -hmm. I probably would be really close to that hundred thousand with driving back and forth to work. For for Ben having driven that a hundred thousand miles, I have not heard him talking about doing like oil changes nearly enough for. <laughs> no, I heard him talk about it. I never heard him talk about it one time. One time in five years and a hundred thousand miles. Like Every five thousand miles. I just did one the other day. 
actually didn't you guys did, did i tell you about the uh the stripped out uh bolt on the yeah rear diff yeah yeah i, I still gotta get that fixed <laughs> i'll wait a few years so ben did can you really tell me you've changed the oil 20 times in the last five years uh not 20 times but i've changed it then then you haven't been changing it every five thousand miles well no i haven't hit 100 i'm only at like seventy thousand miles whoa that's a huge change but but <laughs> i'm doing like 25 a year with trips and all that no no well, 25,000 times five is 125,000 miles <laughs> okay all right well i can't math so i'm putting miles i'm doing like four oil changes a year basically once a season i do an oil change okay tim says he has a broken bolt in his rear diff cover also it's been that way for three years you guys are like brothers i saw a picture of tim today i think you guys are brothers from it another mother be, i mean that would explain why he lives in arizona i'd get want to get away from me too misters from another sister or something i don't know <laughs> i don't know how all those things go oh well we also want to thank our sponsor patriot patch head over to patriotpatch.co and check out their selection of great patches shirts cleaning mats signs and stickers you can also join the patch of the month club for 15 bucks and receive a patch matching sticker and artist proof each month so our uh, patch of the month came. There it is. It's Lady Liberty. And uh, she's got, she's ready to put the smack down on. She's got her brass knuckles. She's got her night vision. Um, and uh, she's holding what I believe is an M1 Garand. Uh, but it's got like the, the PEQ uh, laser designator on it. Um, which is... Uh, I guess helpful if you're shooting with night vision. Um, and it turns out there's a companion patch that showed up with that bad boy. It's Justice, Liberty's uh, sister, um, well endowed sister. She's got that trench shotgun, the bayonet on it. Yeah, that's. And... I, I I like that because you know at first I was like these look really similar, and then you like realize missing the crown, and then. Yep. Justice is blind. Yeah. Uh, Eric says it looks like an M14. That could really be. I don't have. Oh, yeah. You know what? Because it has a magazine, it would not be. It would not be a, gar a Garand. It would. Uh, it makes more sense to be an M14. So yeah. I'll roll. I'll go with that. Absolutely. Yeah. So they both are wearing load bearing vests and extra magazines and things like that. So, yeah, really cool. Check out Patriot Patch. But beyond that, we've got our off-road podcast patches. Um, if you don't have one, um, besides Jeremy, if you don't have one, write into us. We're going to keep ignoring Jeremy. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you can get the our companion patch, the Lumen Locker patch. Glow-in-the-dark Lumen Locker patch. Yeah. Pretty sweet. Uh, Eric, um, you are not, Eric wants to know why he didn't get justice. Um, you are not special enough, um, or sponsored by Patriot patch. That's why you didn't get it. So I'm assuming it's on their website. You can, uh, you can yes, probably buy it separately. Yeah. It's a, it's a separate patch that is open to buy versus having to go out and get, it doesn't come as part of patch of the month club. So it's like another yeah. reason to buy another patch so you have the companion patch with the patch of the month yes and the good news eric is the headliner in your nissan probably is the same material as the headline in my nissan and so these patches will stick like nobody's business up there they won't be like mine that fall off all the time yeah which did i, did I mention my sister borrowing my forerunner yes yeah so we, we were talking this weekend her fiance and i and he's like I didn't realize how many patches you had. And I and I laughed at him. I'm like, I still have a whole toolbox full full in the garage. Plus I have mm -hmm. a, a patch panel on the front door. So like if I find a patch around the house because it got drug in with a piece of clothing or 
um, I get the patch of the month, I'll stick it up there till I get a chance to take it out to the forerunner. So I've just got like a whole patch panel on the front door, like stuffed right now because I haven't emptied it in a while. Yep. Well, our patches are 13 bucks each shipped if you want. And that's in the U.S. shipping prices. And if you want an, any additional $10 flat fee per additional one. Um, or if you are around, you want to swing by Ben's place or my place and pick them up or meet us in public. Um, we can hand them to you for 10 bucks in person. I don't um, buy it, I swear. Yep. Um, yeah, so hit us up. You can you can send us the money through our PayPal off-road podcast at paypal.com. So yeah. And then uh, yeah, look forward to those. Have tire troubles ever left you deflated? Colby Valve has got you covered. Ever have a valve stem leak? Colby Valve makes reusable and easily replaceable valve stems that don't require you to remove your tire from the wheel. They work with your off-road rig, ATV, side-by-side, -side, commuter vehicle, or even your tractor. Never be left stranded again because of a busted valve stem. They also have a tire repair kit for those punctures that keep you away from doing your favorite thing, wheeling. Make sure to check out ColbyValve.com or ask for them at your local off-road product store. I feel so stupid. I was looking for the button. <laughs> Where were you looking for T the button? The wrong page. <laughs> Tim Tim says he'll take one for 10 bucks, personally delivered to Arizona. Uh, aren't, I think you're a truck driver, Tim. Just drive up here. Drive I the mean, truck. Do your job. Drive truck. Truck driver. Will uh, if if you pay for me to to come down, I will uh, deliver you patches. Sounds yeah, that sounds good too. I'm sure there's lots of fun places to wheel down there. I mean, Tim wouldn't know his Jeep's always in the garage, but I'm sure we could talk to other people down there that aren't Jeep Club members and find places to wheel. I think, I think that'll work. Yeah, I I actually uh, Arizona's on my list right now of places I want to go. But, you know, that list is yeah. very long and goes kind of like this. It's like, oh, I want to go here and here and here and here. <laughs> but I don't want to go here right now. I want to go here first. He says he can only afford Forerunner gas. It's understandable. I, I If you pay me what it would take to drive down in Forerunner, I will uh, go ahead and all right. Well, our news story, our first news story here is about the Rivian. And uh, this is an all electric uh, news episode, by the way. Um, the, the Rivian gets a camp mode. So it says it's got a battery save deep sleep mode. It levels the vehicle within six and a half inches of vertical travel. So right now, I would assume that it couldn't level it enough in the picture that you got up on the screen because oh. he's going down going down a hill that looks like a little more than six and a half inches of vertical travel. The I, internal display. Sh oh, go ahead. I, I think that's with six and a half inches of vertical travel. If it only leveled within six and a half inches, that's not very level. Uh, I think each, each shock has an up and down or each corner can move six and a half inches up or down. I don't know. I know. Aaron said within six and a half inches. Of oh, vertical. Oh yeah. Well, if, if the back was six inches high. Oh, and... I'm thinking of it as a tolerance. Like, it'll be level within six and a half inches. Oh, I see. No, no. I was saying, like, if if, you're, if your front end or your back end is six and a half inches high, it can level it up to that amount. Got it. Like, okay. it could squat all the back or, or squat all the front or Horrible. side to side. Yeah. Um, the internal display shuts off says internal floodlights in mirrors help illuminate the camp. So it's got built-in floodlights. A lot of cars actually have that. In fact, my F-150 has that. So the it's FJ not that amazing. And they're not very really bright usually. No, but I mean, honestly, I've set up bright camp lights and it's, it's too obnoxious. So yeah, yeah. dim ones are good. Dim ones are good. Um, it says Rivian's already come with a detachable speaker that doubles as a lantern or flashlight. Um, I guess that's if you hear light, or maybe it has a light bulb built in. I'm not sure. I'm sure it has a light bulb built in. Oh, it's got a little <laughs> display that you can use as a light. The display. 
Uh, and then it says Rivian has put many things to woo the off-road community, including a training class with off-road instructors. So yeah. I've actually been seeing quite a few Rivians uh, out there in the off-road world. And, and we know that the Rivian, you could get that camp kitchen thing built in the back too. So um, they're kind of doing a lot of cool overlandy things. I, I watched a video this week of the Rivian truck and this guy had a, steel ball bearing the size of a tennis ball and he set it on the tonneau cover of the truck and it started to roll away and then he grabbed it real quick he went to the truck pushed a button and it takes i think 90 seconds to level the truck up to 90 seconds push the button fast forward through the video he goes and he sets the ball bearing on the back and it's level so hmm. ball bearing doesn't move that's pretty that, neat. that is pretty cool yeah it's it's interesting because I saw it was Bill Burke. Um, I think he lives in like Colorado or something like that. He's like one of yeah. those famous overlander La Land Rover guys, and he put on a big class with like twenty of the Rivians, and he was praising how awesome it was. Now he hmm. could have been paid to say that. I don't know, but no, he has he has one and he drives it around. So yeah, it sounds like he really likes it then. So yeah. I don't know for what his opinion's worth. I mean, I try not value other people's opinions too much. Just ask <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, go ahead. I I just mean as in a because uh, they could be paid for it and all that. Huh. I I was just looking at the the Rivian Camp Kitchen setup. That is and that's actually pretty awesome. Everybody. Yeah. And it's tray. So the 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 cooktop is actually an inverter style in in induction. inverter induction. induction. I knew it started with an I. So it's an electric cooktop in induction style. I don't know if that uses less electricity or not, but it does. So it, it okay. uses magnetism to heat up. So you have to have magnetic cookware. It's actually the we have an induction range in our uh in our house um so it doesn't actually get hot it uses mag magnetism to um to make the pot hot so the pot heats up not the cooktop yeah yeah eric says that bill was a camel tro trophy participant he's legit he gives great classes um i actually bought a couple of his uh training videos on dvd probably 10 years ago and uh they were probably produced 10 years prior to me buying them. So they were a little uh, outdated. I, I mean, still good information, but they were definitely, um, you could tell they were produced way back in the day. So yeah. And Tim says, if we sell all of our rigs, we could almost afford a Rivian and then timeshare it. <laughs> there we go. Not wrong. Not wrong. I mean, with as little as we wheel anyways, right? Yeah. It'd be perfect until we all want to go on the same trip, right? Well, then we all f pile in together. Oh, yeah, true enough. And then what about snow camping? Who's we'll sleeping with who? We bring tents. Okay, there we go. Well, <laughs> he says dibs on the turn after Aaron. Tim, you don't want it to the turn after Ben? <laughs> all right, Ben, why, speaking of Ben, why don't you take this next uh, article? All right. So I was trying to figure out how. So the the electric range uses fourteen hundred and forty watts per hour, and the battery size on the Rivian is only one hundred and thirty five kilowatt hours. So you have what one use out of it for ten minutes? Uh, I mean, you could have one hundred and thirty five. It's kil kilowatt hours and watt hours. Then. Oh, okay. I miss. I miss that. Yeah, kilowatt. I, Kilo. I'm trying to decide if that's enough to worry you or not. It depends upon your trip. Um, kind of like Eric just said here, um, I'm gonna have to pass on battery powered overlanding because I imagine uh, refilling in the woods might be a little hard. Well, you just have to camp long enough that solar panels will charge it. Twenty eight days in one spot sounds great to me. <laughs> that does sound. Or every other day you stop at a campground with hookups? I mean, that would be kind of the way to do it. If you're going to do it, would be campgrounds with hookups. 
the because don't some of the hookups are like two two four two forty. I don't know. I've never camped at a campground with. Well, I've never used hookups at a campground, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'm going to move on to this next story here because um, uh, you may have seen it. You may not have. Uh, Jeep has announced its next set of vehicles. And uh, um, I, re- I, re- I strictly remember us talking about Jeep trademarking the, uh, the recon name. And we thought it was because of the trim model. Um, that they used at least for a little bit there with the Wranglers. Well, it turns Mm -hmm. out they're using it for a electric off-road Jeep. Uh, They're calling it the Jeep Recon. It's a fully electric, non-removable top, but it can fully open like a a Sunrider style. Um, Doesn't really give a good shot. Ah, Here we go. So it'll retract like that. Um, It looks like the windows in the back pop off. I don't know exactly what they got going on with that. Um, it, to me, it kind of looks like a, a Bronco and a Jeep had a baby, and this is what it made. I kind of like it. I, I can't tell how big it is. It looks, it looks smaller than a Wrangler. It's it's hard to tell. They're claiming that it's supposed to be kind of that Wrangler esque size. Okay. Um. So it's, I don't like. I also I don't like how tall the hood is in this picture only because wranglers i feel like wranglers are known for having a low hood that's easy to look over and if you're going to be off-roading it that's an important feature well they've got cameras for everything now now to replace all that (laughs) um this is expected uh for 2024 not a whole lot of information um the off-road capability is expected um thanks to the select select train terrain traction management systems they have um it's expected to have electronically ac- locking axles um they also announced the wrangler e- wagoneer s and the avenger that's going to be overseas the avenger kind of looks like a uh what's that other jeep the uh the little one we have here the renegade it kind of looks like what the renegade should have looked like um and it's kind of like that size I don't know. I like it. The Wagoneer has like this fastback thing, um, it, but it's supposed to have a, but it's the, it's supposed to be a plug-in electric, kind of like the, uh, the four XEs are, or I guess like the four XEs are, but it's supposed to have enough range to have, or supposed to have 500 mile range. They said something like New York to, uh, Toronto. No. Yeah. Alberta. Yeah. Alberta. In, uh, no, I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure it was Toronto. Uh, at 500 miles yeah. is what they're saying. Yeah, which is, I mean, that's kind of like the big thing that everyone's been talking about with these electric vehicles is a lack of range, um, because like the 4xe Jeep, yes, it's 4x, yes, it's um, hybrid, but the electric range is only 24 miles or something like that in full electric. Well, that's, well, that's pretty, pretty typical, typical of, of, and of that's the hybrid. Like Stuff it's like a hybrid that. so yeah that yeah. that's kind of what well, i'm like well it's a hybrid that's what i would expect is not to have huge range and you make up for it with the low fuel cost and when it's using both of them together it's kind of help so i don't know yeah. i'm i'm kind of excited for the recon to see i'm, I'm optimistic i'm optimistic i i want to see some videos of it doing wrangler stuff i want to uh, they didn't say anything about trail rated i don't see a trail rated badge on any of the pictures or is that a trail rated badge in that upper corner right there? I can't tell. That is one right there in the upper corner. It's, it's really small though. I feel like it's smaller than a, a trail rated badge normally is. So I don't, I don't know. So I, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm excited for it. I am a little optimistic. Um, but as we remember from SEMA or not SEMA, um, Easter Jeep Safari, they had that all electric, uh, wrangler and i think that's kind of what this is coming off of is it's a mix between you know what we want out of a wrangler and what we want out of a grand cherokee for the size and all of it that so Mm -hmm. i don't know the doors come off that's that's important to me that's like the one thing i miss with my forerunner i could take off my doors but it's a pain but to take take them back 
or to put them back on. Just leave them off. No. And they're structural, unlike the Jeeps. I mean, that's one thing that the, the in the Jeep it says it says the door the via the, they only are there to protect you from the elements. They're not structural. Versus and my forerunner and all that. That's a part of the structure that's going to help protect me in a crash. And that's why I'm like, when I see people without their doors on, they're like, well, you should have bought a Jeep if you want your doors off for safety reasons. <laughs> but, you know, not not my cow or chicken. So have fun with that. Yeah. Yep. What did you just say about their wife? I said, not my cow, not my chicken. You run your own farm. I know, I just... I'm trying. Yeah. Go prepared with Warren Industries. They produced the first recreational winch in 1959 and lead the industry with their dedication to quality and reliability. When you dig yourself in deep, make sure you have the right tools to get yourself out. Get Warren equipped and go where others can't. Now, let's get ready for adventure and head into our main topic. So this one is kind of going off the not mine, but yours. This is what this is all about. This is to help you choose your kit for your vehicle for your trip. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the stuff and things to consider when we're talking about you and your stuff and getting you ready for the trail or whatever you're doing, be it overland or whatever. So, yeah. Well, the first thing, the first thing you got to start off with is to determine what type of wheeling are you going to do? So are you just going to, um, do four service gravel trails to like campgrounds. Um, you're going to do OHV park trails like to You're going to go uh, out where the country boys go and do the mud sling and mud hole bounty hole business. Uh, are you going to snow wheel? You're going to go snow wheeling with the off road podcast crew. Are you going to do destination wheeling where you drive halfway across the country down to Arizona? Um, go wheeling down there. That'd be destination wheeling. Uh, you do some rock crawling. That's still, I mean, you can do rock crawling at the OHV park or at your destination wheeling, but maybe the rock crawling you're going to do isn't a destination or isn't at an OHV park. It's just a trail somewhere in the woods. So still kind of different and then the last one would be mall the most the one you need the most gear for hands down would be mall crawling yeah but you got to mount it all on the exterior of your rig it needs Everything. yes it needs to be seen everybody must know what you have yes not just the stuff that doesn't fit or is too dirty to come in the vehicle everything yes. yeah and, and tim says uh you're gonna need to spend are you gonna spend your time with the di in the ditches with ben <laughs> then all you need is a bumper rope and a buddy to pull the ditch for you. Yeah, yeah. You need a lot of exactly. gear. For yep. And preferably some salsa. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about the salsa. I really did. Yeah. Eric says that he'd pass on the mud bogging and on the rock crawling, but he has crawled a mall or two. There you go. Haven't we all? Haven't we all? Yep, got a part cool in the mall. So one of the big things to consider is how long are you going? Because uh, what are you going to need with that? Are you going to need more gear, less gear? Are you going to have room for all that gear? Yeah. So like the destination wheeling, um, it's going to take you a while to drive there and a while to drive home. So you are probably going to want more gear in case you break while you're there so you can get yourself home. Unless uh, yeah. you're towing on a trailer. And uh, what if you have a problem with, uh, say you break something, do you have your tools with you for that? Stuff like that is to consider. Um, our next one here is, uh, what are the risks going to be? I mean, like we said, a long trip. You're on that long trip. What, what type of wheeling are you doing can determine what you might break or might not break. Mm -hmm. um, are you alone with someone? Can you split up some of that gear responsibility? Um because if you're in a group, that will help um, with some things. Like uh, someone brings the uh, the salsa, the salsa. Someone else brings the blackstone. 
and uh, someone else brings the scottle. Yeah. And then some other guy brings a pizza oven. A pizza oven! Whoop, whoop. Like my type of uh, overland trip. Yeah. Uh, you wait till next year. It can only go, it can only get better. Uh oh. What are we doing next year? Bigger explosions, even better food. Okay. You're really setting a tall order. I better start looking for new uh, new kitchen gadgets. <laughs> well, maybe we'd need to bring the, the Rivian out there with the uh, induction cooking. There we go. If we're cooking for everybody, we'd burn that thing down so fast. <laughs> yeah. The ba- the battery. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, we need a generator with us to charge it up. Um, cell coverage. Um, are, are you going to have that? Do you have a satellite communicator like a Garmin or a Spot? Um, how much food and water do you need? Um, those are all very important questions. And all that stuff takes up space. Um, and sometimes you need to divvy up uh, some of those with some variants. Um, so we'll start off here with uh, shovels. Um, are you in sand, snow, dirt, rock? Um, do you want a wood handle or metal handle? Um, weight is everything, right? And durability is another thing. Um, do you want a long one, a short one, a folding one? I mean, that's all things to consider um, because if you have a um a standard shovel on your roof that's going to take up a lot of space and uh are you going to be able to fit your rooftop tent up there with that so you might want to go to a smaller one well so yeah let's talk about shovels um ben you've got a fancy uh shovel the demos yeah which worked good in the sand it might work it might work okay if it's not icy snow, if it's just like fluffy snow. Fluffy snow it works really good. I've done that. Yeah. Um, but it it definitely won't the the demos you have definitely won't work in rock. And it, I don't think it yeah, and I don't think it works that well in dirt. No, it's garbage but, and dirt. Potentially very soupy mud, but yeah, I guess you could drag soupy mud away, yeah. So yeah let's talk about a a pointed shovel so i rock that fisker's all metal one so it's all metal that means it's heavy and it's full length but it does great with uh dirt it does great with kind of rocky soil it'll it'll work decent in snow you can move sand with it but not as easily as you can move sand with uh the demo shovel so yeah and if you're um tim tim mentions here rarely carries a shovel because it's all rock Um, yeah hard to dig if it's rock hard to dig rock you'll need a pickaxe for that yeah (laughs) so now i want to see somebody stuck on like you know bottomed out on some rock and they break out the pickaxe (laughs) (laughs) ding 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 Uh, been working on yeah Yeah. so the last but Let's get back to shovels real quick. There's one more use for a shovel besides your vehicle being stuck, and that's for going to the bathroom, which we talked about a few episodes back. And uh, the demo shovel that you have been is not good for digging a hole to poop in. No, not not at all. Unless you're pooping in sand. Or so. Snow. Yeah. Uh, well, no, because you want to get under the snow into the soil by six inches. So that is true. Uh, that is true. And yeah. and that, that top layer is frozen. Yeah. So, but this is a, where a folding shovel can really shine because not only can you dig your hole with a folding shovel, but you can turn that head 90 degrees and you can use it to sit on at least one cheek to sit on it. Um, oh yeah, Jeremy, I'll give you a demonstration next time we're out. I, I don't want a demonstration. <laughs> oh yeah. I'll give you a demonstration. Oh, they work you- honestly, they, they work really good for that. So uh, and other things, the folding shovels, they, they're terrible. Honestly, they, they don't move very much material, but when you do turn the head 90 degrees, um, you can use that to drag stuff out from underneath your truck too, um, yeah. which I've done, I've done before. It's kind of like a hoe to, to dig out from underneath. So, um, that's kind of one of the pluses, the folding shovel, but beyond that folding shovels are pretty worthless, but they do take up very little space. They weigh less. So, yeah, so if you you're really trying to so maximize, carry both. if you're really trying to maximize your space, that's where fo- uh, a folding shovel comes in handy, especially if you've got like a two door JK. 
Eric says sitting on a metal shovel when it's cold pass. Um, when it's got to when it's got to happen and you're snow camping and it's, um, 20 degrees outside, just grin and bear it. Um, literally bear it. And, uh, yeah. And you don't want to in your camp. I mean, I've nobody never wants got to. a problem with pooping without having to sit on something, Aaron. I, maybe it's a luxury that you just haven't experienced yet. It, it's super nice. I, I recommend five stars. Aaron is old. You got to remember that. I don't know if you can <laughs> I, I forget that I'm the youngest in this podcast by a fairly wide margin. I also have a bidet at my house. And mm, well, I mean, I can't oh, for that one. I just, wish I had a bidet. Yeah. See? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe you're missing all of the magic. There's more magic to be had. Well, you could get a portable bidet, bidet for uh, snow camping if you want. Yeah, I, we're sure. going to build an overlanding bidet, that's for sure. Yeah, there is one. There's a wand. Yeah. Little, they, they have little uh, portable squeeze bottle ones. No, I, I want hot water powered, hot water. Um, pressure pressurized. Okay, I'm going to get a pressure washer and that'll be <laughs> All right. Well, we're kind of uh, going, literally going in the weeds here. So, <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, let's the toilet. Let's, let's talk other stuff. Straps. Uh, how many do you need? How long are they? Um, do you need a kinetic strap like a bubba rope? Do you need a static rope like a tow strap? Um, you know, you just use ratchet straps to tow vehicles out. Is that good? Um, you know, if you like to live dangerously and tie lots of knots and hoping that it works, um, but generally not, but I mean, a ratchet well, strap is a strap that you may need to tie down some gear. Yeah, it, it absolutely. It's, it's a gear tie down. Um, I did use one of those two inch wide, um, bigger ratchet straps one time to slide the back end of my truck around, um, to work myself around a tree. Um, so it can be done. Oh, we um, used the ratchet strap with the um, stink the bug. Yeah, stink bug when we were trying to get it off that. Yeah, that stump. So, and it works. And you can use ratchet straps for fixing things. We used a ratchet yeah. to fix my uh, when my drag link came. Oh yes. And well, came. and, and uh, if you oh, yeah. if you saw that video that's going around Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram where the dude's driving with his. Uh, think it's like a full-size truck and he's got uh the log ratchet strap to his axle and he's driving out of the woods with that because his see his axle broke so yeah it's, yeah so yeah yeah ratchet straps are viable and they actually don't take up much space you could have two or three of them in there i mean you yeah. can buy a four pack at uh harbor freight for 8.99 when they're on sale so they aren't very costly either yeah and like a, so. a static strap i mean having your 20 or 30 foot strap because i mean if you got to get flat towed out it's always nice and you don't want to drag that kinetic rope out yeah yeah it's, you you can buy cheap versions of those two if you hit the tow rope portion that or the tow strap yeah. so that way when you do drag it it gets ruined you don't feel so bad Yep, that's when it turns. That's I, I don't know. I wait till my straps kind of get a little afraid, and then they become trash straps, and that's when we we're dragging trees and stuff with them. Yeah, uh, Tim oh. says that a, a lot of things work on the stink bug that don't work on a full size rig. Custom made lift blocks, for example. I don't know. I've seen some custom made lift blocks for full size rigs that. Well, I guess maybe they shouldn't have them. So maybe that's your proof in the pudding. <laughs> I don't know. Um. Yeah. Um, though I will say like a bubble rope, uh, mine takes up a good chunk of space compared to all the other straps. They fold flat and all that. So they're a little chunky, but I think that's one of those gear pieces of gear that you can almost call a requirement nowadays with how versatile it is. Yeah. Cause I mean, you can use it to tow, um, and it's great for recovery. I mean, there's the snatch straps and all that. So, yeah. and, uh, can't forget about another type of strap, but that's later. Yeah, save it. Well, let's talk uh, something else that's kind of that needed piece of gear, but it can take up a lot of space depending upon what you got, and that would be the jack. Um, one thing to Who's consider that Who? is a jack base. Who's Jack? Who? Why does jack? he have to ride with? Why does he have to ride with us? Well, if you buy used tires like a, a member of the crew here, 
and you <laughs> love to go through tires. Can confirm, considering that the first time I went wheeling with him, he blew a tire out. Oh, I've blown a tire with both of you. Yep. Yay. The look of shame on their faces. Um, so, yeah, you've got several different types of jacks here. You've got a bottle jack, um, which is very nice and compact. Um, a floor jack, which is big, very loud as you drag it across the ground. Um, <laughs> but probably one of the, the best for lifting um, for people to use while working in, in the garage and all that. Um, an exhaust jack, which Aaron finds not very effective. And I, I've i never used one. I think they would they, work sand and snow. Yeah, I, there's got to be a reason why you never see anybody talk about them or use them. They just must not work that well. And then the um, high lift jack, which um, I've used a high lift jack uh, a couple times and it's worked pretty good. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll have to excuse me here for a minute. Yeah. So, yeah, there's different different types of jacks um, like we're talking about. And you can use them for different things, too. Um, thanks for, thanks for hanging out, Eric. Have a good night. Um, the high lift jack, not only can it be used to lift, but it can also be used to pull or separate things. You can pry things apart. You can pull or, things together or clamp things together. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, you're right. You could clamp. I had never thought about that. Yeah. Yep. Well, congr congratulations, Tim, on your first ever. I'm surprised that it's your first ever, especially in the hood that you used to live in. Um, let's talk winches. There's a lot in the winches category, sponsored by Warren. Um, the first one would be shackles, which you can get from Warren. There's a couple different styles there. You can get soft shackles or the D-ring. Some people call them bow shackles, which would be the metal ones. So why would why would you want to choose one or the other? Well, the soft shackles are lightweight and very, very strong, but they can get rubbed the wrong way. So it's always a good idea to have maybe two yeah. D-rings. Also, they don't fit in every single toe, toe point as well. Yeah, and, and if that toe point is not um, chamfered, um, then they'll break too. Yeah, which is, I think, what Jeremy meant by them not going to the right toe point, right? No, so they sometimes they don't fit because oh I yeah, mean, if, if you look, too, a soft shackle is too. a bit a bit wider in diameter than just a uh, a bow shackle pin. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, but like we we're mentioning, I'm gonna just take it all the way back to the beginning here. If you're going with other people, like we talked about. It sounded like we were joking, but when we go snow camping, um, we split gear up like kitchen duties and things like that. We were talking about the different things we bring for the kitchen. Have one person bring or two people bring jacks and have maybe only one person brings the the boat, the metal bow shackles and one person brings um, a shovel of each type or something like that. You don't have to have every single rig with a shovel. Yeah, some some gear though you will want to double up on um, straps, for instance. Um, that's yeah. something we had um, winch line extension, um, which we don't have on here. Um, yeah, we do. Did we? It's in there. Yep. No. Oh, I yeah. just missed. It. I can't read. Sorry. Yep. But um, well, so the next that's a good point though. When when you're snow camping, you can never have too many extensions. Yeah. <laughs> At least where we were. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been times there, there was one time we were out wheeling and we, I think it wasn't us cause we came up a, upon the group ahead of us, but we donated some winch extensions to the cause, uh, because there was a big snow drift and it was probably about, it's probably about seven or eight winch extensions to get to the nearest, uh, winch point. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a whole lot of winching right there. Well, I mean, it was just to get through the, the snow drift, but yeah, the snow but, drift I mean, is only like 10 feet, but oh, I got you. I got you. Oh, vehicle see. Crew, it, it took, you know, it was, it was probably like, uh, something like 800 feet. Yeah. That makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Uh, well, then once that once that rig's on the other side, people can winch off of him rather than right. dealing with 800 feet of line. Yeah. Well, the, the next item in the winch uh, department here is a line dampener or damper. I'm not sure why I always add an N and damp, damper, but um, those, everybody should have one. Um, there's no reason not to carry one per rig. Sometimes when you're, when you are winching, you may set up a pulley block and you need two. So you go to your buddy and you get that second one, unless you have two on your rig. So, and, or and if for some reason winches. you're short or you haven't got one yet, you can use a coat, um, and a tool bag to help Absolutely. weigh it down. Um, mm -hmm. but you do need something that you can use as one. So you need to know what that is. Yeah. Uh, so the next item here is the extension, which we just talked about. Um, if you're running synthetic line, I guess I should say, even if you're not running synthetic line, you could have a synthetic extension, um, which won't take up a lot of space and it won't weigh a lot. Yeah. And, and it, depending upon what you're doing, you might not need one. I mean, if you're mall crawling or, you know, you're doing forest service roads, you might not necessarily need that extension. And you can use a uh, strap as a alternative extension, but that's only 20 feet versus or 20, 30 feet versus I think what my my extension is 50 or 75 feet. Well, also, when you say use a strap, you have to be very careful. You it has to be a static strap, cannot be kinetic. So it would be your tow rope, not your bubber rope. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And it needs to be rated at whatever your winch is able to pull at it's generally going to be rated for that if you're or more using it for your vehicle unless you're using toe strap or something dumb yeah so, the walmart yeah. hook strap don't use yep. that. The, the hook strap yeah that's the hook straps are like rated for three or four thousand pounds those are so. good for the road nothing else yep so uh i mentioned earlier snatch block um I would say that you only need one of these, especially if you're in a group. Maybe you don't need, maybe every other rig brings one because they can weigh a lot unless you get those little rings. They weigh less. They're a lot more compact. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And I, yeah. I I, actually have two in my kit, um, but I, I use synthetic. So I kind of, it's like, hey, there's enough room in here. I lost enough weight cutting down on my shackles. And all yeah. that that I can have fit that extra snatch block. Yep. Uh, a bridle is going to not take up a lot of space. Usually they're only eight, six, eight, ten feet long. Um, a land anchor. Now this is, there's only two real versions of this. There's the metal land anchors and then there's the dead man Um those metal land anchors are are heavy. They're definitely bulky. Um, I've still yet to see anybody that I know wheel and and have one um, wheeling ever. I've just never seen them used. I've no, and the, and that's the thing is like here in the Pacific Northwest, I don't really think there's much of a use for them. I mean, I yeah. can see the dead man coming in handy with some snow wheeling but you're gonna do a lot of digging um mm -hmm. and that's just you're in a really crappy spot and that's when it's a good point um maybe you're alone in, in a really crappy spot or no one can get around you um but like uh i know like the alaska off-road warriors with the mud stuff they were dealing with and then um being in like the sand dunes i think mercedes used hers which we can no, use. I think they, I th I think they had one, but they didn't use it. Oh, because they never got stuck. So, yeah, I I, I think it just comes down to, uh, you know, when it's a good time and and a good place, and being yeah. in the dunes might be a good place yep. for you. Versus, it's got to, it's got to be appropriate for your type of wheeling. That's and that's what this is all about. Your wheeling. Yeah. And, and the last one in the winch last one in the winch category is the winch line repair kit. Uh, we talked about this when we had Factor Fifty Five on a few weeks back. Uh, the Fast Fid um, doesn't take up much space. Um, it's like the size of two chopsticks in a 
custom chopstick carrying case, basically. So doesn't weigh yeah. anything. Tuck and it anywhere. That could really save your recovery. Yeah. Yes, you can do it other ways, but this is super simple, not expensive. Yeah. Um, let's talk here about recovery points, uh, what they are, um, if you need to add them. Um, like you've got your factory OEM recovery points, which are not necessarily rated, um, but are they safe? And, and they, they might be rated to tow the vehicle out, but they might not be rated for shock loading yeah. the vehicle out. So it's, it's really important to know, and depending upon your trip, risk. Um, a hitch shackle, I think those are pretty handy to have as long as you have a hitch to use. Um, if you don't have a hitch, it's pretty worthless. And so you better have some aftermarket bumper recovery points with an aftermarket bumper if you don't have that hitch one. We got a Facebook user who says, I can do the same thing with a BIC cap and a little electrical tape. Yep, absolutely you can. But like I was saying, this tool is not very expensive and uh, doesn't take up a lot of space. And it'll always be with you. And I guarantee it will be better using this tool than than with a jury rig setup like a, a a big cap or pin and some tape so yeah and it's best what's in if if a big cap and electrical tapes what you feel is best for you then right on rock on with it um sometimes it'll be easier for other people to have stuff that has instructions if they don't know um for the better of them um and then uh this next one's here's traction boards um Aaron, have you ever successfully used your traction boards? Yeah, I have. How many times? Probably about 40% of the time. 40% of the out. time. 40% of the time I get out 100% of the time. <laughs> yeah, so I mean it and we we've we've uh uh we've tried recovering with traction boards and had problems and we might have yeah. used them wrong. Um, and sometimes they work. Um, are you going to need traction boards for a forest service road? More than likely. Only to look cool. Only to look cool. Uh, unless you got to, unless you want to use them for bridging because of a washout or something. If you've got traction boards that are rated for bridging, not all of them are. Um, Travis says they're great for leveling a vehicle at camp. Absolutely. Um, Tim says go Seahawks. Um, I think you're watching the wrong show, Tim. This is the uh, Offer Podcast. We're not doing sports ball. Uh, apparently, uh, Jeremy's now doing sports ball. He just put a Seahawks hat on. I, I've been following the game as we've been going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but like no, Ben sure. said, the traction boards have worked and they also haven't worked. So if you have them, bring them with you. Find out the situations they don't work. And then when you go on those types of trips, don't bother bringing them because yeah, you know they won't work for that situation. So, yeah, it just it, it really comes down to, you know, uh, are you rock? I don't think rock crawling with traction boards is uh, necessarily something. Would you need traction boards in Moab? Probably not. No, no, because all the traction is already there. It, it does snow in Moab occasionally. Yeah, but I don't think yeah. you're gonna be digging yourself. Yeah. I I you I could see you using them on some of the trails where it's not just slick rock, um, as a, a ramp or as a. Honestly, I I don't see them being used for bridging because they're short enough that anything in Moab is going to be driving across whatever you bridge, so it's not yeah. that big of a deal. Yeah, and I think a lot of the other stuff is you just stack rocks, like Tim's saying here. Yeah. No, he's saying you use the traction boards when you don't have any more rocks to stack. Oh, well, dyslexia wins again. I, I don't think that's dyslexia, but... My lack of reading skills, yeah, that's dyslexia. Backward <laughs> comprehension. Yes. Yes. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Give men dumb. On, on to tires. I, you gotta have that spare tire. I mean, you what? Have, but 
What? You you need a full size spare? Uh, I mean, it usually helps. You don't need need is is relative. I mean, if you have yeah. a trailer and you're just you know on, at an ORV park, you know, mm-hmm. you you probably you might not need a spare. a spare tire with you. But or, or like we talked, if you're in a group and it's it's the uh, Toyota Fortune Four Runner run, and everybody because they're basic has the same size tire, same brand tire, um, same offset wheels. Um, the only one person needs a spare. Man, I'm the black sheep in that crowd. Negative 38. The, granted, I am on 33-inch tires, but they're they're mud trains. They're not uh, Vulcans or KO2s. Uh, Tim wins. Tim wins. He said Colby valves. Yep. Good, good job, Tim. I, I, I throw that in the tire repair kit. Yeah. So you need a tire repair kit, obviously. I mean, I, I think pretty much any type of wheeling you're doing, you need a tire repair kit. Um, At a minimum. And you need some way to air up and air down. Yeah. Uh, whether that's an air compressor, a CO2 tank, uh, you got monster valves. Well, if ARP. you don't need a way to air down if you trailer and you show up air down and you leave at the same pressure. Yeah, that is true. That That's is true, yeah. but but having a way to air up if you need if you um, lose a bead or whatnot um, is definitely a necessity. Yeah, because yes, you can run on zero air in the tire, but if you have no beads, bead and you need to rebead it, you know. Yeah, or you throw your spare tire on. Yeah, and then you uh, and Tim saying head to the gas station if and put air in it, and you know you'll be all right. But you, uh, you'll you'll have cup tires by the time you get back. Well, I, I've run with people out here near Browns Camp, and there's a gas station not too far from Browns Camp. So people air down, they wheel all day, then they leave Browns Camp and they drive on the highway for 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and they air up at the gas station. I mean, we did it when we were in Christmas Valley. We drove all over with aired down tires. Yeah. So... As long as you have a spare tire with air in it, though. Yeah. Make sure you're checking. That's part of maintenance, Ben. Oh, wait. You're, what? Maintenance? I'm supposed to check my spare tire? Yeah. But yes, it's still there. I just looked, you know. Um, We we didn't mention, but there's different types of air compressors. Um, There's cheap ones that plug in. There's super expensive twin ones. There's You could have a reservoir. In case you wanted to run air tools well not all of them are electric either you can get some belt driven ones yeah or a bicycle pump <laughs> oh you can be awesome and have a, a power tank and be the the first one aired up and wondering what's taking everyone else so long and then you get bored and start airing them up i i think we need to make a bet for the next time we all meet up and go wheeling together and whoever loses has to air up one of my 40s with the bicycle pump. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, my back and shoulders are already hurting. Yeah. <laughs> just don't just lose. thinking about it. Well, yeah, we'll, just uh, don't lose. we'll say whoever drives into the most ditches and can't get themselves out. Yeah. Go away. I got this. Leave me alone, Jeremy. Just stop trying to pull me out of the ditch. <laughs> Um, and then uh, here's this next thing is, uh, do you need this? Uh, do I need a, you know, chainsaw? Um, you're on a long trip and you're going to uh, Moab. I don't think there's many trees you're going to need to cut out of your way in Moab. Um, or it's um, the middle of August here in Washington. Um, most of the trail, most all of the trails are cleared. Probably not going to need a chainsaw. You know, I, 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 I'd still bring it in Washington. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. I guess I, I overpack, but I just don't want to take that chance of being most of the way down a trail and there was wind last weekend and no one's been down the trail since and a tree blew across it. I mean, I, I, I think it just depends upon the situation and the time of year and where you're going, though. I now mean, that Eric now that Eric from Oklahoma isn't on anymore, we can say, well, if you live in Oklahoma, you won't need a chainsaw because there's no trees. Yeah. Uh, in Texas or Arizona, I'm sure they don't have trees there either. Yeah. 
I mean, they, they have just don't, feet, just don't think they're in enough density to actually matter if one blows down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, you could always trade that off for an axe. It takes a lot longer. Um, to chop a chop a tree and then winch it out of your way. So yeah, an, an Tim, has, Tim Tim has added some did you needs here in the comments. He says refrigerator, air conditioning, rock lights, limb risers, things like that. Yeah, well, and, and he's talking about guys in Arizona with limb risers. So mm -hmm. I don't think you need them that badly. Here, here going down. Uh, what was that? What's the one up by Chelan? The jungle. Uh, the, jung the jungle. That was a spot. Jeremy actually pulled out his limb risers, right? Uh, no, I don't think he did. But I, I don't think even limb risers in that dense really helps that much. No, no, not much at all. Um, first aid kit. Um, um, if you're me, you need to carry one with you every day, every place, because you <laughs> never know when you... I'm surprised you don't have one of those ankle kits yet. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised I don't have one now that I think about it. That probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Just, I mean, keep, keep one of those duo, the Advil duos, where it's, uh, uh, uh Tylenol and uh, ibuprofen in one, and then like, uh, <laughs> A split. Medical Gear Outfitters has a good boo boo kit, and they actually have a good uh, pocket mm -hmm. kit. Yep, yep. I'm kind of surprised they don't have one. I might have to go buy one now, and I know where I'll go. Well, yeah, but I mean, it also depends on you know the the type of wheeling or trip you're doing is going to kind of drive what type of first aid kit you get. Yeah, and how big, how big how big the first aid kit will be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and did you custom build it, or did you buy one that's pre-built? And do you I'm, need to get some more stuff for it because you didn't get the the off-road podcast designed uh, kit there on? Yeah, go get the one from Medical Gear Outfitters. Yeah, yeah. and get ten percent off. Yes. Yeah. And Not an ad at all. And then when you uh, when you use things because you're Ben, you just get refills from them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, and it really comes down to, you know, like, what's in it? Like, um, Dietrich had never thought of a uh, a tick remover as far to, as part of something in a first aid kit. Um, and that's what that kit has, you know. It's those things you don't think about. Rattlesnake anti-vitum. That's kind of, uh, I don't have very many rattlesnakes here in western Washington. So, not something I'll need probably might be a good idea to get sooner or later um oh, i think they're don't coming me. for you they're coming for me now i mentioned them um and here's something that everyone should have and it's gloves yeah, these are, these need to be in your kit because these right here most important tools you have um it helps you open the door helps you drive helps you recover helps you yourself go, helps you go potty yep helps you go potty um, imagine you, having to exactly. imagine having to ask somebody to help you go to the bathroom for the rest of your life because you didn't put gloves on. Yeah, um, having to uh, you know dig that latrine because um, you you don't want to poop all over your campsite. That would be terrible. Um, I'm just so many different things that you need those hands for, and yep. they are the only set you'll ever have. Um, yes, they have prosthetics out there, but they'll never work like the originals. <laughs> It's very true. Not yet. Not yet. I mean, you give it a couple, uh, you know, couple decades. I'm sure they might have ones that work as well, but it's going to be a while. And uh, who wants the replacements when you can have the originals? Um, this next one's kind of important too. Is it spare fluids? Because when your brakes are leaking on a snow camping trip and you have to pump some <laughs> brake fluid off of some random stranger? Yes. From ev from everybody at camp. Yes. And, and then find a random stranger on the way down the mountain. Yes. Yeah. Um, it helps to have your fluids. Um, yeah. You should always refill those after you use them too. Because your brake fluid? <laughs> yeah, like if you if you use it and then like, hey, I need some more. I should. I have my kit. No, um, my brake fluid is part of a sealed system, so when I use it, it stays in there. It doesn't come out. Yeah. What? You don't refill your brake 
once we- weekly. It's not a consumable <laughs> typically. It's oh, not, wow. not usually. Man, I you know I was I was starting to wonder why why you know I got weird looks and they knew when I was coming in they're like oh you need some brake fluid Ben. Makes yeah. sense. Also, you put that. Did you put that? You buy that on Amazon and click the thing where they it's a subscription right? to brake yes. fluid. Yes. But don't worry, he can stop at any time. Yeah. Any time. Also, did you ever bleed that? Because it probably soaked up some air from that. I that's I actually replaced my brake lines completely, and it turned out it was a, a cylinder on the uh, the um, the brake caliper, the calipers. Yeah. So I had to replace calipers too. So I yeah. got new brake lines, calipers, and. Yeah. I'm not hearing is him saying, yes, I bled the brakes after I did all this. Well, when you replace a brake line, everything behind it drains out. So, yes, I have completely I brand new brake fluid twice over because I had to change out two calipers. Yeah. Did the wrong side first. I remember. Yeah, it was quite. Go Ben. <laughs> no, no that, I, I got to say that was not my fault. That was their fault because they ordered the wrong part but you blindly installed it no i brought it home and then looked at it i'm like hey this is on the wrong side and that happened twice twice and i went back and i was a little upset and then i had to go drive to sumner instead of bonnie lake to get the right one and then they laughed at me well uh the next item here is a, a toolkit so um, like we're talking here, it needs to be appropriate to what you are doing. Um, and if you're only going to the OHV park and you brought a trailer and you, you break something really bad, you just need enough gear to get you back to your trailer. You take it back to your house, you load it, unload it, whatever. Uh, you don't need a giant toolbox full of things, but if you are going to Iceland and you're going to be very remote and there's no trailer to pick you up. You might want tools that will work for every nut and bolt in your rig. So are you going to want standard sockets or metric or both? That depends on your vehicle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You you only need enough to do your vehicle unless you want to be a sweetheart and have the opposite of what you have so you can help other people on the trail. Well, that's also something you got to kind of think about when you're putting aftermarket parts on your vehicle is use hardware that's going to be fit within your toolkit. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah, you're, I, I know you're, I've put some SAE fasteners on my Jeep that has most of metrics. It's because it's, it's because it's Italian. Bibbit of Appa. <laughs> Um, yeah, spare fuel. There's another one right there. Um, are you going to the ORV park? Are you going to need spare fuel? Spiel, fuel? <laughs> fuel? Yeah, um, sorry. Um, or are you overlanding and you don't need any because there's a gas station in every 25 feet? You mean mall crawling? Yeah. Oh, is that what that is? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it uh, like when you're, he- when you're heading to Riggs and Coffee, you don't need to get gas. Yeah, just enough gas to get there and back. And you, you don't, don't need a full tank. You mean you don't need to carry two jerry cans with you? Nope. Nope. But you're going on that long trip across the desert to go to Moab and rock crawl all day, and you're worried you might run out of gas. It might help to have a spare tank or Absolutely. 10 gallons, five gallons. How about spare parts? All the spare parts. Yeah. Just bring a spare if, rig with you. If it's Ben's vehicle or a Jeep, you need all the spare parts. If it's a Ooh. Nissan, eh, just one axle every once in a while. Yeah. And, uh, you know, extra bolts too. Nuts and bolts. Especially commonly used ones. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's a makeout session going on right now in our YouTube chat. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh, All right. Uh, Facebook user says even more important if you are a diesel rig and have spare fuel, as a majority are gasoline. Uh, it's hard to beg off of others. Yeah, absolutely. And not all gas stations have diesel um, out in the remote areas too. So, 
and um, or deaf. Yeah, that's true. Or deaf. Just delete it. Should definitely delete that. Yeah. <laughs> But we did not recognize, we did not recommend that uh, here on the Off-Road Podcast because the EPA um, said so. That, that That's a bad thing to do. And, yeah. you know, we must follow everything that the government says every time, every second. Because we trust them. What's our uh, last one here? Um, wow, I can hear you all the way from Oregon? Yeah, that's I'm talking. On that antenna. I'm talking on my Baofeng. Well, it's because it's a long one. See, look how far it goes. It's still going. It's still going. Wow. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. It's a long one. Oh, uh, Eric here is saying uh, maybe a spare airbag, Aaron. <laughs> Ouch. Uh-huh. Ouch. <laughs> Woo. That stings a little. That stings a little. Just a little? Just a little. Well, my ears hurt from it going off. So, yes, <laughs> my ears. So yeah, communication is the last one. So, and this all depends on the group of people you're going with, or if you're not going with any people at all. So, um, we yeah. mentioned early, we mentioned earlier, um, satellite communicator or cell coverage. Um, if you don't have those and you're going to be in a group, you might want a CB, a GMRS, an FRS, a ham radio for listening. If you're not licensed things like yeah. that. Uh, and, and you really don't want to be the guy that embarrasses yourself. Uh, <laughs> wow. Spare firewood. Yeah, keep your trailer heavy enough so that it won't flip over that. That, that is very important right there. And um, I'll just heavy enough that you break an axle. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh man. Two zingers and one. Oof. Yeah. Man, don't Eric. be the guy that overloads his trailer. You're so the- I guess this, this episode is geared for me, how to choose your off-road kit so you don't break your uh, off-road trailer. Or flip yeah. it. Um, yeah, or so, flip. yeah, um, communicate. Uh, so, CB, um, know what your group's taking because if you've got a CB in your radio and everybody else is on ham, um, you're not going to hear what they're saying. And so it's kind of useless. So know what you're, if you're with people, know what they're running. Um, have something that can reach out. So having a ham radio or the, um, or a satellite communicator or a, uh, new iPhone, I hear something's going on with the, uh, Androids too. So they'll be able to send out a, a, a call for help. Yeah. Through satellite. Pretty so, nifty. That'll so it'll probably be one of our news stories coming up. Yep. So it really comes down to, Hey, what's your group running so you have the same stuff they are or if you're running by yourself how you can communicate with people around you to help you if you need that help um i know some of the forest service roads if they're logging it they'll post a sign that says um log trucks uh channel 11 and you kind of want to listen to that so because they report what corners are coming around and it sucked to not hear or see a log truck coming around the corner um, and it's really narrow and he's going to have a hard time stopping. Uh, Tim says, uh, that that should have been part of our news section, the Apple 14. And actually Tim, that is a news story for next week. So you are like looking into the future, my man. And then, um, something I, I, I saw when I went wheeling with John, um, uh, from Rainier Arms, um, I totally forgot to put my radio back in my rig and he brought a radio and I didn't have my spare FRS radios in the rig or anything. So we had no form of communication between the rigs. So that's when we had to use uh, classic signaling, flashing headlights, hands out the window, horn honking, um, finger signals, finger signals. Yeah. Like, Hey, you know, so it, it really, you know, it helps when you can communicate. So do you need a spare? Um, it might be worth having like a spare handheld or two um, just in case someone's dies or gets broken. Um, it's especially with like those cheap bow fangs. It's not that hard for one to fall out of your rig or end up in Koi's rig and 
or Aaron's rig and or Jeremy's. I don't remember where my radio ended up. Or was that something else? Oh, was that winch light, winch controller? No, that was your satellite communicator. Yeah, there we go. My satellite communicator. No, you dropped that yeah. in the snow and Aaron picked it up and gave it to me. So there we go. See? So having having alternative extra communications help. Yep. Uh, you could use flags also. Sim, is that called semi four or something like that, where you move the flags around? <laughs> really something hard like to do when you're uh, driving down the road. Yeah. Very. It's probably hard to do without driving, honestly. So, yeah, especially when you don't know what it means or how to do it. Yeah, and you're trying to stare out the window. What's he saying? Yeah. You, use your horn for some Morse code. Boop, 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 boop. Well, thanks everybody for sticking in there. Appreciate all the comments this week. It was fun hanging out with you guys. Um, I'm glad you guys didn't have to get a room. You toned it down there in the comment section. It's uh, nice to have you there. Make sure you're sharing us with your friends. Um, check us out on YouTube. Um, all the places you can find us. Uh, we, we appreciate you guys. So, um, also, don't forget to check out our patches. Offroad podcast at gmail. Sorry, offroad podcast at paypal.com is where you could send some of those monies. And then don't forget to put your address in there so we can get it shipped to you. So uh, you're welcome for not having Koi back, but I know that you miss him a lot. So God bless America. Don't forget to visit Patriot Patch and join the Patch of the Month Club. Check out our Gaia affiliate link for up to 40% off. Also, don't forget to head over to Warren Medical Gear Outfitters and Colby Valve to see all their great gear. We are a proud part of the Firearms Radio Network. Got a comment or question? Send it to us through our webpage at firearmsradio.net or through our social media channels by searching for Off-Road Podcast. Also, you can listen to us live at overlandradio.com Mondays at 7 p.m. Pacific. When off-road, please remember to have fun, tread lightly, be safe, and courteous. Thanks for listening. So so the comment of the night's this one right here. Same with your hair, only there to protect you from the elements. That's why Ben and Koi get away with uh, not running any. <laughs> Zing.